This episode contains discussion of murder, domestic violence, assault, drug and alcohol abuse, child death, and police brutality. Listener discretion is advised. Kimberly Iron, 21, Faith Lindsay, 17, Sabrina Rosette, 33, Cecilia Barber Fanona, 59, Jermaine Liz Morageau, 23, Olivia Lone Bear, 32, Faith Hedgepath, 19, Cheryl Lynn Jaquo, 43, Monica L. Bersier Wicker, 42. Some have been solved, most of them have not. These are just a few names out of thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women in the nation. Many aren't reported and most aren't even investigated properly, leaving loved ones feeling lost, filled with questions, and feeling as though they can't trust any law enforcement. There is a common saying in Native American communities, when the Indigenous woman goes missing, she goes missing twice. First her body vanishes, and then her story. Why are there so many Native American and Alaskan Native women going missing and being murdered, and why does it seem like nobody cares? All right, so this is part two of our Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women series, I guess now would we say? It's it's a two, so I don't know. Um, It was going to be a one part, and we just can't stop talking. So... We're getting heated about it, and we feel like there's just more to say. Oh, so absolutely. And yeah. Terrell is going to tell us about Ashley. 20-year-old Ashley Loring Heavy Runner was a member of the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana. She was smart, athletic, and a happy girl. Her friends described her as emotionally, spiritually, and physically strong. In June of 2017, Ashley left her home and got into a car with a friend to head to a party. A video posted on social media later that night showed the party and Ashley sitting on the couch with others, drinking beer, and just having a good time. She messaged her older sister, asking her if she could send her some money. Her sister, Kimberly, who was vacationing in Morocco, asked her if she was okay, and she replied, quote, always. The two sisters had made plans to move Ashley from Browning to Missoula, where they could share an apartment. She didn't hear from Ashley for a few days, but it wasn't unlike her to lose her phone. However, after a week of not hearing from her, Kimberly called some of Ashley's friends and found out nobody had seen her since that party. Ashley's family reported her missing to the Blackfeet Reservation's tribal police. They told the family that because Ashley was over 18, she could leave if she wanted to. She's grown up. Leave her alone. I'm so sick. It was... I know. It, it Because, I mean, I get it. A lot of people are reported missing, but it's just families know and loved ones know when there's something out of character for somebody. And that's when you need to worry. If I came to you and said, I can't get a hold of XYZ, and uh, many times I'll go six or seven months without hearing from her, and it's only been two, then I could see you being like, give it a little more time. She does this all the time. If I say, I don't hear from her every single day, but it's been a couple weeks now, and now I'm finding out that nobody has seen her for a few weeks. That's cause for concern. Like, yes, like, it's out of character. So, of course, it was left up to the family to search for Ashley. Later that month, they received their first lead. They received their first lead. That just, you shouldn't have to say that in a sentence. Um, When law enforcement has a job to do, but anyway. A woman matching Ashley's description had been seen running from a vehicle on a rural stretch of Route 89. The tribal police and BIA actually organized a three-day search, but they found nothing. Volunteers found a sweater in a nearby dump that was possibly Ashley's. I'm doing a I'm doing a frustrated blink like that um, gif where the guy's like. <laughs> if you were in a SpongeBob episode, it'd be. <laughs> yeah. So. They found a sweater. Could have been Ashley's. But... But the authorities, they lost it before it could be tested. We love to hear that. And it was like whoops. And that was in the thickest sarcasm I could ever say. How do you lose a piece of evidence? It happens all the time. Oh my gosh. Like You have one job. Mm -hmm. You have one job. And there's like... 
chain of custody for things for a reason and like it's a whole there's a whole thing that goes along with collecting evidence well and again i i i feel like there are plenty of members of law enforcement that do their job they do it well whatever we're not talking about that right now though we're talking about the fact that you have one job that job entails a lot of different things but there are certain jobs you can't make mistakes like this you shouldn't be able to make mistakes like this. How does that happen? Exactly. Like, it was lost. They couldn't test it. I mean, Kimberly found a torn sweater and a pair of red stained boots that she believed belonged to her sister near the edge of the reservation. The sweater was identified by a witness who saw Ashley wearing it on the night that she disappeared. Both of these items were given to authorities. The family has not received any results. Two months passed before an actual investigation into Ashley's disappearance was even launched by authorities. Kimberly said that one of the tribal officers apologized to her, saying that he was sorry about her sister and that he was putting in overtime working on her case, but that nobody was really taking it seriously. She believes that people in town know what happened to Ashley, but they're not speaking up. Unfortunately, while rumors spread, there were no further leads or developments into Ashley's disappearance. Though many deaths of indigenous women are ruled as accidental, a lot of them due to hypothermia, specifically in the northern states, some cases like K. Sarah's, who we talked about last episode, seem to clearly point to foul play. Unfortunately, it seems obvious that law enforcement has pushed many of those to the side. And not only do the deaths of indigenous women seem to be ignored, the many disappearances are seemingly overlooked as well. There are many indigenous people who struggle with substance abuse and what the police might call dangerous lifestyles or um, high risk lifestyles, things like that. Um, When a woman with a history of drug or alcohol abuse disappears, it seems that they're even less likely to be searched for. Why? uh... I don't know if people, people who are in charge, if their job is to search for the missing or to find a perpetrator of the murdered, whatever. I don't know if they understand that no matter what they have done in the past or what they did in the present before they were murdered or went missing, do they realize that these are still people? That's what I'm asking. Because, like, I mean, it's like, you know, the law enforcement... I don't, motto, uh, whatever, is to protect and serve, right? I don't know what the word, the containment verb for that thing is, but protect and serve. Who? Exactly. The... Yes. Right. Yeah. Are they just only supposed supposed to protect and serve the ones who they deem eligible? Worthy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very much like, you know, you will... There are just a lot of people in the world who might call themselves Christians and they don't act like it. And they, like Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And our pastor is always like, and who is my neighbor? Yes. Yeah. Everyone is my neighbor. People with substance abuse issues are my neighbor. People who are living a lifestyle I don't agree with are my neighbor. Like, it's we're just supposed to love people. Law enforcement is supposed to protect and serve people. You don't not just the people that they identify with, not just the people that they deem appropriate or worth saving or whatever. Well, they don't get to be the judge in the jury on something like that. You don't get to decide who is supposed to get the help and get the justice that they deserve. You don't get to do that. This right. is your right. job. Like ooh. Yeah. And I mean if you want to get like really granular with like the high risk lifestyle thing because I know sometimes police will be like oh you know they were living a high risk lifestyle and usually when they say something like that they will refer to somebody who is like a sex worker a sex worker or um substance abuse issues stuff like that and technically like if you look at say I don't know, somebody who maybe like works from home and doesn't get out as much as another person, right? Like that person would, I think you would kind of tend to be like, okay, well, a person who's going outside of their home and maybe um, having to come into contact with more random people, that's technically a higher risk lifestyle than the person who 
works from home, right? Like you're just encountering more people. So somebody who is a bartender technically is living a higher risk lifestyle than somebody who works from home. But we all have a certain amount of risk. I mean, even if you work from home and you have somebody come in and we've seen cases where somebody came in to install something, you know, and the person working from home is home alone and that person then got attacked. Like there's a level of risk for everybody. So get over it. <laughs> like you don't get to decide who gets who gets that Residence attention or not. And, like, yeah. yeah, anybody, even if your job, whatever your job is, if it, including sex work, if that comes into contact with people, it doesn't matter. You should not, you're not like exempt from being safe. And furthermore, speaking on sex work, I know that there are some people who who decide to go into that field voluntarily. And I am not here. Do you get your cash? Like, whatever you want to do. Consenting adults, I'm here for it. However, there are some people who are forced into sex work. So, now mm-hmm. we've got crime on top of a crime on top. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. for you to pass it off like they're pieces of trash that don't deserve mm-hmm. that... Yeah. Yeah. Look at Centoya Brown, who, you know, we can take out the fact that she was a child when her case occurred, just if we need to forget that entirely. But yeah, they, the police looked at her as, uh, well, she was asking for it. Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. When she was essentially, I mean, she was being trafficked. She was being forced into sex work by her boyfriend, giving him all the money. But some people, boyfriend. and to your point, some people look at it as like, well, they were asking for it or, you know, and mm-hmm. ugh, I'm just, I'm so f- sick of this. Like, but I like, do people say that with bank tellers and somebody comes in and robs the bank? We shouldn't have worked at a bank. No, I do. Oh, well, there you go. Like asking for it. I mean, like, yeah, why work with money? Exactly. It only applies in one profession. <laughs> like, you know, it's such anyway. a taboo. It has such a stigma against it. And I don't understand it because, again, if you want to if if you choose to do it again, yeah. get it, do it. I mm-hmm. whatever you want to do. If you are forced into it, though, and you are still put under that umbrella, which you shouldn't be no matter what, like you should never be put under that umbrella where you're like, well, they were asking for it. But if you are put under that umbrella if you were forced into it, that's some bull. Like, it's not fair. I'm just, no. yeah. So we're going to talk about Shakaya. Um, 19-year-old Shakaya Blue Harding was born into a family of addiction. Her mother was an addict, and as Shakaya became a teenager, she began struggling with alcohol and drug abuse. She was eventually diagnosed with meth-induced schizophrenia. Shakaya was living with friends and on the street until she began staying at the Tumbleweed Runaway Center in Billings. Shakaya was last seen on July 23rd, 2018 at Tumbleweed. Yellowstone County detectives found that a bus ticket was purchased in downtown Billings on July 4th in Shakaya's name to go to Colorado. There was no evidence that that the bus ticket was ever used. Rumors circulating said that Shakaya was sold for drugs and then trafficked. The highways that run through Montana and into other parts of the country make it impossible to track women that are suspected of being trafficked. While many of the crimes against indigenous women are committed by non-natives, tribes realize that this is there is still violence against their women committed by those who live in the tribal community. The lack of clear law enforcement boundaries seems to almost make it too easy for murders and assaults to take place within reservations. 13-year-old Mackenzie Howard, Tlingit native, was found beaten to death in her small community of Cake, Alaska? Cakey? I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't Yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't know. It took 11 hours before the Alaska state troopers arrived on scene, with investigators taking even longer to show up. One of the community members said that the delayed response wasn't unusual. Quote, when there's any fishing violation or hunting violation, they're here in full force. To have one of our own laying here for so long was traumatic for everybody. 
So you can see the level of priority an Alaskan native has to a fishing or hunting violation. Like, <laughs> right. A 14 year old teenage boy from the same community ended up being charged for her murder. 17 year old Yupik native Stella Yvonne disappeared in Bethel, Alaska in 1996. And we said this in the last episode, but we are doing our very best with pronunciations. Please be compassionate or have grace for us, I guess, because we're just yes. con- country bumpkins that are, that are doing the best we can here. They don't have every pronunciation available. We show respect and we offer grace. So she had missed her curfew, leaving her friends home around 2 a.m., which led her to being locked out of her house. Stella walked across the street to the police department. An officer walked with her back to her grandmother's house, where they attempted to wake Stella's grandmother by banging on the front door with no luck. He offered to drop Stella off at her sister's nearby apartment. He left her there around 4.30 a.m. Stella left her sister's apartment sometime between 5 and 6 a.m. to walk home, and she has not been seen since. That's just so, like, it's like she was with a police officer. I really don't understand. She should be safe. Yes, I don't understand, personally, why someone would feel, a police officer would feel okay with letting an a minor out of their sight or custody without talking to a guardian. Right. Like, if you weren't comfortable leaving her at her grandmother's house because she wasn't coming to the door, but you just drop her off at her sister's apartment and not make sure she walks in, like... What was even the point of helping? Yeah. At that point, exactly. you know? Exactly. What was the point? Like, I don't know if this officer was just like, all right, I've already done, like, I'm done with this. Like, yeah. Take her back. yeah, what was the point? Well, take her back to the police station. Make some calls. Let her sit there until, yeah, exactly. Exactly. There has been no solid information shared with the public and no concrete developments. 43-year-old Native American Valerie Jeanette Sifsoff Sifsoff? disappeared in 2012 while camping in Anchorage, Alaska. Her boyfriend said that around midnight they'd had an argument. Valerie walked off without any of her belongings, including her cell phone. He said that he looked for her but couldn't find her. He left the campsite the following day. Valerie's family located some of her clothing in the area. But she has never been found, and there are no reports of her boyfriend being investigated as a person of interest. Now, I have a bone to pick with this one. Her boyfriend, who was the last known person to have seen her alive, he said she walked off. He tried to look for her. And this is in air quotes, tried to look for her. I don't know. And then if you, so if I, let's say, I can't even think of something. One of my friends, her son, he lost an AirPod. He's got the two, right? Because you have two ears. He lost one of his AirPods. He came home sobbing. And he's like, I lost one of my AirPods. Can somebody help me find it? They went and looked for hours. Could not find it. I feel like my friend's son did more to look for his AirPod Mm -hmm. than this boyfriend did to look for her. Because the next day, he's like, well, she ain't here. Guess I'm going to leave. Yeah. Guess she's not coming back. Did he report it to the campsite? Did he report, were they in a state park? Like, or did he just kind of look around? And and again, we're not saying that we don't know what happened, but it's just, I don't know. I feel like my husband wouldn't leave without me unless there were like park officials searching at that point and they said, okay, go home. We'll call you if we find something, but we've got it. I'm not leaving without her. Well, and also I feel like there are different circumstances, like for you and Andrew, let's say you go missing and I'm not saying that you're going to, but like maybe steer clear of, um, well, no, actually, do you want to go camping soon? Mm, Maybe? No? Okay. All right. Well, but if you did, um, but you have kids at home, so it's like, okay, I got to get back to my kids or something, right? Like there are other circumstances where you might need to leave. Right. Yeah. It doesn't sound like this is it. And we only know what we know, obviously. I understand that. Yeah. All I'm saying is we have talked about cases where people have lost loved ones in different countries and they fly immediately there and they don't leave until the authorities are like, look, we've done everything that we can do. We're going to keep investigating. Like, this is the next day. Yeah. Yes. It's the next day. It is just. Yeah. And they didn't investigate him or like, and I don't know what they, I don't know what all they did, but he's, he's not, he's not been investigated. There are no reports of it. Take it seriously. You guys, now we're going to get into, like, we've already covered several, touched on several cases. 
we have more, but we have L- almost no information yeah, on little them. to no information. Yeah. And I feel like it's um okay, so if you were to watch the murder in at Bighorn docu series, we touch on certain cases in that. We Shakaya, Kaysara, Kaysara, Selena, and um Henny. We touch on all four of those in this docu series. And a little bit of one of the others, it, it was a, a colder case. Diane, but she went by Dee Dee. But anyway, mm-hmm. we talk about where we hear about all of those. But then at the end of it, you see a list of all of them that are in that area. And the list is as long as my arms combined. Like it is so long. So it's like this, I know that it's going to be not difficult in the sense that it's not important, but it's difficult in the sense that it's going to anger you because there's nothing to go on. There's no Mm -mm. information. Yep. It's so sad. (sighs) 59-year-old Native American Deborah Nicktoon left her apartment in 2020 in Fairbanks, Alaska, and has not been seen or heard from since. There have been no further details in her disappearance. And I do want to say, and I'm so sorry, I do want to say that the dates of these is alarming too because you might think an older case okay they don't have a lot to go on because it's 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 a cold case at this point right it's like it's it's been so long 2020 Mm -hmm. three years ago yeah 18 year old alaska native karen dean evan was last seen in may of 1980 in anchorage she has not been seen or heard from since no further details in her disappearance 37-year-old Ida Rose Jacome, a Native American, disappeared from the Circle M bar in Fairbanks in October of 1975. Her purse was found in the parking lot. No further details in her disappearance. 62-year-old Native American Lorraine Juanita Guinness was last seen in Fort Yukon, Alaska in 2018 walking near her residence. She hasn't been seen or heard from again. No further details in her disappearance. 32-year-old Native American Marianne Alexi last spoke to friends at 3 a.m. in October of 2012. She traveled to Anchorage for school. On the phone call, she sounded intoxicated and told her friends that she was lost and didn't know where to go. She had a history of alcohol abuse and a few run-ins with law enforcement. She has four children. She has not been seen or heard from since. No further details in her disappearance. 29-year-old Hispanic and Native American Ashley Elizabeth Rosales was last seen in New Mexico after having an argument with her sister. She left her home and wasn't seen again. She missed her court date to regain custody of her two children. No further details in her disappearance. 25-year-old Tina Finley of the Coeur d'Alene tribe was last seen in 1988 in Plummer, Idaho. A man gave her a ride from a bar and said that he dropped her off near her home. He passed a polygraph regarding his involvement. Her purse, ID, and shoes were found on the side of the highway. More of her belongings were found in an abandoned house. No further details in her disappearance. 39-year-old Mary Johnson of the Tulalip tribes was last seen on a road in Washington State on her way to a friend's house in November of 2020. No further details in her disappearance. 24-year-old Native American Khadija Rose Britton was last seen in Covello, California, outside of a house. She was being forced into a vehicle at gunpoint by her ex-boyfriend after a fight broke out inside the home. Though the man has been identified, law enforcement has not filed any charges against him, stating that they need either a body, a confession, or hard evidence. No further details in her disappearance. Does a bunch of people at the house seeing him force her into a car at gunpoint not count as evidence? I have heard of so many cases where they keep people for less 28-year-old Native American Jansen Sekedi was last seen in January of 2011. Her boyfriend said that she left home to walk to work. She hasn't been seen since. No further details in her disappearance. 
34-year-old Native American Kimberlina Yellowhair was last seen in October of 2021 in Beto, Arizona? Not sure. No further details in her disappearance. 54-year-old Native American Marie Benali was last seen in Beto, Arizona in November of 2021. No further details in her disappearance. It's a month later. It's one month apart. Yeah. In the same area. Same city. Nothing. Some of these are dating back to the 80s. No further details. Some of them have actual suspects that we all can see. Mm Mm-hmm. But just nothing. Nothing. Help me. Help me. Make it make sense. Completely lost. The list, like like you said at the end of that documentary, and if you just look this up, I mean, the list of missing women seems endless. And the number of deaths are just as upsetting. There appears to be multiple things that have and continue to contribute to the lack of attention and focus on missing and murdered indigenous women. The first and foremost is that it's difficult to identify and present a problem when there's no reliable data. It's known that the rates of murder, rape, disappearances, and violent crimes of Native American and Alaskan Natives are higher than national averages, but they remain skewed. Less than half of violent aggressions and crimes against these women are ever even reported to police. And whether this is because, you know, victims are scared to report their attackers, or maybe they've lost faith in law enforcement, it means that more crimes are happening behind closed doors. There's also research on the rates of violence against these There is no research. Did I forget the no? Oh my bad. Additionally, there is no research on the rates of violence against these women living in urban areas, which accounts for over 70% of the American Indian and Alaska Native women. There's no reliable count of how many of these women are murdered or go missing every year. And again, like we said in last episode, many of these cases are misclassified from the beginning, wrongly labeling the women either Hispanic or Asian. Asian. I, again, want to present to you a theory, and I don't know if I'm alone in this. Like, Torella, do you feel like it's possible I mean, definitely hearing from somebody who was involved in, I mean, at the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office where they live very near a reservation and there is a larger percentage of indigenous people in the population. Did you say presentive? Did I? Yes, you did. Oh, God. There's a larger percentage of indigenous people in the population as compared to, I don't know, maybe here or I don't know. But he can sit there and look you in the face and say, that's in your head. That's not a real thing. We don't have a problem here. And Mm-mm. I don't even think that he means just there. I think he means as a whole. It's, it's not, just a, not problem. a thing. It's Yeah, it's yeah. nothing. There's nothing wrong. He just doesn't believe MMIW at all. 100%. Which is astounding that that is something that somebody, I mean... People have these thoughts in their heads, right? Flat Earth, everything is, you know, even when you're brought with facts, you, you, you're you met with facts and people are still like, nope, I don't believe it. I know what happens, but what pisses me off so bad, I think that, I mean, and I could be completely wrong, allegedly, right? And I don't know, this is just my own thought inside of my own little nog. Uh, the noodle is noodling. So I wonder if they are mis- classified or misidentified as an indigenous woman because of people like Eric Winburn who don't want to contribute to the problem. You know what I mean? They're like, okay, well, we're not, it's, see, it's not that big of a deal because it happens everywhere. So quit saying that it's a problem because it's not. That's just my thought. I don't know if it's true or not, but I wonder. It makes you wonder because it's a known issue. It's not a guess. It's not an opinion. It's this is happening. It's fact. Exactly. Yeah. And so it just, it it begs, you know, begs the question of is this on purpose? Are they doing this on purpose? I don't know. But what's pissing me off about it 
Well, everything pisses me off about it, honestly. Everything about this, you can call it an epidemic, you can call it whatever. Mm. Everything is pissing me off about it. But I'll be honest, whenever I first started watching the murder at Bighorn, I thought, wow, we're actually talking to somebody who is in the capacity of he's showing up as a under sheriff for the Bighorn County Sheriff's Department. Mm-hmm. And I was not expecting that because it doesn't shed them in the best light. Then after hearing from him, I'm like, ooh, yikes. I f- hate this guy. Like, mm-hmm. not it for me. Not interested. He's awful. And what what is the deal with the hypothermia? Because what are the odds that this many women in that area, I get in Montana, I can get cold and miss, I, I understand that. But I just looked it up and it says each year in the United States, about 1,330 people die of cold exposure every year. Well, all right. So let's look up. um, And I'm not saying that everybody that has gone missing or was murdered because it was what, 24 to 50 or 30 something to 54 people a month. So let's do it on the high end. 54 times 12 is 648 people. Mm -hmm. Let's say that all of them, and this is in one state alone. We're talking times four, let's say. That's 2,592. If they all died of hypothermia, we're way out of the ballpark for how many people are supposedly passing away from cold exposure. It doesn't, like... Did you ever watch that movie Wind River? I think it has Jeremy Renner in it. No. I think it's called Wind River. So he is in law enforcement and they find a body out. Somebody finds a body out in the cold and it's a woman who appears to have frozen to death. And so they're trying to figure out what happened, what happened, who is she, like all this stuff. They go through this investigation. Um, She's from a reservation. So there's all this jurisdictional sh- We're like, well, they handle it, but we can't handle it. So they bring the FBI in and like all this stuff. So anyway, it turns out that because it, if you looked at her, like, and she was only wearing like maybe a tank top and underwear. She didn't have any socks or shoes on. Like none of it made any sense. Right. And she was in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. just and frozen to death. Sure. So finally, as the movie goes on and all this stuff, and sorry, if you've not watched it and you want to, this is a spoiler alert, but here you go. Um, John Bernthal is also in the movie. Um, I know him. He's, uh, he's an actor. He was in Walking Dead is where I first saw him, but he's been in a lot of different stuff. He's, I'm actually surprised you don't recognize the name, but okay. he plays her boyfriend. And at some point in the movie, they find him dead too. But what happens is he is there in this area working on some construction site or something. I don't know. So they're all these construction guys or whatever, whoever they are building, whatever they're, I don't know. They are staying in all these like little trailers, like around wherever it is that they're working. White men. She is a Native American and I'm not sure how they meet or whatever, but they meet. They obviously care for each other very much. They're in a relationship. The white men that live in these trailers where he lives, because it's like a bunch of them, you know, so it's like he has a bunch of roommates or whatever. They have been giving them a hard time about this relationship from the get-go. One night, they come in, and they are drunk as hell, and it's him and her together. Like, I guess they were supposed to be out, so they thought they were going to have some time together. They come back, and they're all very drunk, and they start getting really aggressive. They start, they try to rape her. Um, He stands up, and obviously, like, he gets in a fight with them, but he's outnumbered, like, 10 to 1. And so he tells her, run, take off, and they beat him. I think they beat him to death and then they dump him out. Well, she runs and she's she's so far away from everything that she's trying to run away. And eventually she drops and she freezes where she laid. So, yes, she died from hypothermia, but there was an attack that precipitated that. Why are these women and children walking out into the It's not even wilderness where some of them are found. They're just right there. But why are they just walking outside and laying down and dying? Something happened. Well, exactly. And that's insane. And I don't doubt that that 
has happened, right? I mean, like, that's a completely plausible theory that could have happened, right? What I don't really understand either is there have been a lot of cases where there is absolutely nothing to support a sexual assault or a sexual advance has happened even. But that's what the prosecution goes with. And then that's where we, that's the narrative that they've presented. But they won't even bring that to the table. Like, they won't present that at all. Mm -hmm. It's like, they won't think about anything else. It's just like, and again, like we said last episode, nobody 16, 14, 18, 59, whatever, without a pre-existing condition, you don't just go out into the field and lay down and die. You just don't. You don't go to the next door neighbor's house and lay down and die. It just does not happen. No, and it, like, something caused that. And I would like to know the number of people... I would think that if you are going to die of cold exposure, that there would be some extenuating circumstance. Like, I was driving my car through the mountains and it broke down unexpectedly and I was by myself and I tried to walk and get help and I just didn't realize how cold it was or that that it could happen this quickly in the cold or whatever. But these are people who, from here to right there could have walked into a home Mm -hmm. and and been safe and these are people who live in this area who know how cold it gets there Mm -hmm. so for like for somebody who is used to this who lives there to walk outside with no clothes on and then just lay down there is just no way and i mean exactly like there there are so many holes in the police's story that, I mean, again, like what we said last time, they give you this much and they give you this much. And then they're like, that's good enough for you. And also it's none mm-hmm. of your business. What else we have? Like there, it, it's not fair. The burden of proof is not on them. They're like, we told you everything we're going to tell you. Too bad. So sad. And I understand if it's an active case, the family cannot get all of the information while they're investigating. I understand that. But we're that's on the case. not the situation. <laughs> yeah, that's not the situation that we have here. I mean, we're losing evidence before it's ever even tested. Um, not working the case at all. Appointing the father of a murder victim as the sheriff. Who has been accused of sexually assaulting his daughter. Who has an active order of protection against him. Yeah. What are we doing, guys? I have no idea. It just... But, Torella, I want you to tell me about um, Savannah's act. So, regardless of the reasoning, this is a problem that has been overlooked and ignored for entirely too long. In September of 2020, Savannah's act was passed, and this is a bill that required the Department of Justice to, quote, strengthen training, coordination, data collection, and other guidelines related to cases of murdered or missing Native Americans. And it aims to clarify law enforcement responsibilities and improve tribal access to resources needed to respond to missing and murdered cases. The bill was named for Savannah LaFontaine Greywind, who was a member of the Spirit Lake Nation. In 2017, her body was found in a river She was 22 years old and eight months pregnant when she was murdered. The Not Invisible Act was introduced in 2019 and intended to increase intergovernmental coordination to identify and combat violent crime within Indian lands and of Indians. And that's a direct quote. Both are steps in the right direction, but there's still much more to tackle. In the documentary that we told you about um, on Showtime, And this tells the stories of the women in Bighorn County, Montana, and that was called uh, Murder in Bighorn. One of the indigenous women described their female population as, quote, the silent population that disappears. It's now everyone's responsibility to make sure that these women are no longer invisible, no longer silent. For ways that you can help, please visit the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA Facebook page we will link to that um, down below. We also want to highlight the Strong Hearts Native Helpline. So this is strongheartshelpline.org. And this is a safe, confidential, and anonymous domestic and sexual violence helpline for Native Americans and Alaska Natives, offering culturally appropriate support and advocacy. And they work in partnership with the hotline. So that's the hotline.org. 
and that is the National Domestic Violence Hotline as well. But we were actually contacted by Chris, and he works with Strong Hearts, and asked if we might highlight those organizations, and we will absolutely do so. So we'll link them below. Those are the web pages. And I do want to say, if anyone is listening that would like to, or not would like to, but like needs to reach out to the Strong Heart Foundation, it's completely safe. If you get onto the page and you are in any danger while on the page, it's easy. You can just hit escape twice. It gets you out of it. There's no way to figure out that you have been on it in any way. Like, I thought that that was, I mean, we've talked about it before we got on here, but I think that that is amazing. It is such a good resource. Any, If you or anyone you know needs that resource, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And the, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline has information on their website if you need to, like, know how to appropriately, like, clear your browser history and just all the back-end stuff that you might need to do in case somebody is monitoring what you're doing when you're not there. Yes. Um, so yeah, they've got really great resources on that stuff too. Um, and it's sad that you have to do that, but here you are. And one of the men in the murder in Bighorn said the most dangerous thing in the world is an insecure man. That really resonated with both of us because I, I don't know a truer statement. How many cases I would, I mean, I'm just ball ballparking. Yep. 98% of cases that we cover boil down to an insecure man. Yeah, absolutely. I will say that I am grateful for the job that we're able to do. Not because of, I mean, one of the biggest things of why I'm grateful is because it has opened my eyes to so many things in this world, so many marginalized communities, people's, like, I I didn't know. I just, I did mm-hmm. not know. And I think that you shared this sentiment with me. Like, I, I'm so grateful for being able to grow and understand. And I know that I will never understand in the way that someone who has a, been directly affected by this will ever understand. But I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'm sorry that I didn't understand before, but I'm, I'm working. We both are. And yes, this is so important. And I hope that everyone who started listening and watching has made it to the end because this is important. And if we don't care, it's never going to change. Absolutely. And one thing that you can do, this is not, this is not to help us, but, you know, take a screenshot if you're listening to anybody's episode on, on this topic and share it and invite other people to learn about it or, you know, like if if we get the ball rolling, there are so many things. We have seen cases be solved because of people listening to podcasts and then, oh, I, I remember something or getting involved. I mean, there's just so many different things that can come out of it that can be so positive. And there's just a lot of stuff going on in the world that it's just been really hitting me lately. And I've been thinking, you know, it's us that are going to make this change. It's our generation. Absolutely. Like, we've got to do something. We cannot be John Mayer waiting on the world to change. Like, we have to make some movement. Well, and while this is incredibly serious, I, it just makes me think all the snow. We got to do something, right? Like, I know the song is silly and the movie is silly from Forgetting Sarah Marshall, but, like, it's the, the sentiment is oh. true. Yeah. We got to do yeah. something. Like, it, and yeah. it's not going to change, to your point, it's not going to change unless we mm-hmm. all make a change. Yeah, exactly. And, like, I was thinking about it a couple weeks ago and just, like, it's it's not like we, I know, you know, a lot of people are busy and things like that, you know, whatever. Just take one, one more step than you've ever taken before. Yeah. If that, you know, if before you've just thought about it and thought, gosh, this is awful and we need to do something about it, um then this time share a video or share a post or take that step to make a donation to an organization that will help or uh, buy a shirt that benefits or absolutely i mean i think that the least you could do is to support someone if you can financially but i also think 
on the teeniest little scale that you could. For me personally, it was listen. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Mm-hmm. And I will say, as a person who sits in a seat of privilege, I had to, I, I, I can, I, the least I can do is listen. That's it. Mm-hmm. But I want to do more. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So whatever that one step was before, just do one more than that. You know, what's that just one next thing? Because if, if we all just do one thing, something's going to happen. It has to. It's going to be this wave of change. It has to. Yes, absolutely. So let us know what you guys think. Um, and if you guys have any, link. if there's any more resources that you guys know of, please yes, send them yes. our way. We'll link the ones that we have. But yeah, absolutely. If you have others, please send them over. But thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and listening. We love you, care about you, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Bye. Bye.